네, 그러면 지금부터 서울 안보 대화 두 번째 세션을 시작하겠습니다. Now let us start the second session of the Seoul Defense Dialogue 2020. 먼저 오늘의 주제를 담은 영상이 준비되어 있습니다. An introduction video on the theme of this session has been prepared. 함께 보시겠습니다. Now let us watch the video first. places previously unseen. Our mission continues to grow. The armed forces will stand with you. security and defense. A dialogue for the future. I hope you enjoy the video and I wish this session will bring us to thoughtful discussions today. 지금부터는 전문가 패널 분들과 사회자님 모시고 함께 진행을 하도록 하겠습니다. 오늘 세션 2는 국립 외교원 김준형 원장님께서 사회를 맡아 진행해 주시겠습니다. So now we're going to have the panel discussion with the topic of non-traditional security threats implications for national defense. And for today, Mr. Kim Jun Hyung, the Chancellor of Korean National Diplomatic Academy will guide us. Please lead us to the discussion, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Good morning and hello everybody. Um, uh, just as I introduced, I am uh, Chancellor Kim, uh, Korea National Diplomatic Academy under the arm of uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Korea. And I welcome you all to the uh, Seoul Defense Dialogue 2020. As you know, we, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, we are holding this conference online. And I'm sorry I have to wear this, this uh, mask here because recently Korea is experiencing some surge. We are doing okay, but we'll make sure that we be more careful. So let me you know, show you my face one second. That's, I think, is a manner. Okay, hello, everybody. I have to go back to it. Okay, uh, we have an excellent panel, panelist today. Today's topic is non-traditional security threats, implication for national defense key issues. I think this 
it's, it's uh, unusual, but these days we have so, so many uh, webinars. So I think it's thanks to technology, I think it can be an opportunity to expand our horizon and reach out uh, more global audiences. So we have an a excellent panel. We have uh, many participants online. So we are going to dig in these issues because these days, the pandemic and corona itself tells us how important this non-traditional threat. So we have uh, five excellent panelists. Let me go through five panelists. And we're going to uh, give you a mic for the presentation in this order. First, uh, Dr. No Hoon, President of Korean Institute for Defense Analysis, uh, Republic of Korea. Uh, here we go. And Dr. Shin dong Yu, Professor, Department of Computer Science and Engineering, Sejong University, Korea. And we have uh, three guests online, and Professor Hugh White, Emeritus Professor, Strategic and Defense Studies Center, Australian National University, Australia. Next, uh, Director Pascal Boniface, Founding Director, the French Institute for International and Strategic Affairs, France. Welcome. And Hello. The, yeah, last not the least, Dr. Thomas Carlison, uh, Adjunct F Fellow, Global Health Policy Center, Center for Strategic International Studies, United States of America. Welcome, you all. It's, an interesting thing is actually I've been to Austrian National University a few years ago, and I actually I visited uh, French Institute of International Statistics Affairs last year, actually last November, and then of course CSIS. <laughs> okay, I welcome you all, and we are going to have first round for presentations. Five five minutes will be alerted to the uh, presenters. So why don't we start with Dr. No Hun. I'm gonna speak Korean. Uh, please use earphone. Uh, First of all, I would like to take this opportunity to congratulate you on the hosting of the Seoul Defense Dialogue 2020. It is indeed a great honor for me to participate in this session. As have been introduced by the moderator, I will be talking about the non-traditional security threats and its implications for national defense specifically in Korea. Concerning this issue, the biggest motivation behind this dialogue is definitely the recent COVID-19. The recent COVID-19 is a global pandemic that has presented great challenges to countries and militaries around the world. The, the outbreak is still ongoing and the ROK has proven relatively successful in managing the spread. Specifically, the ROK Armed Forces has been assessed to contain the outbreak successfully among its ranks as well as contributing to the national defense. The ROK military has preemptively prevented the spread of the virus within the military one month prior to the government's measures. And we believe that it has been quite successful given that many service members live in close proximity to each other. Moreover, the military has made significant contributions to containing virus in support of government and civilian communities by supporting quarantine and sanitization measures at airports, seaports, group facilities, and temporary quarters for recruit returning expats. It is still ongoing. We have also utilized our unique medical expertise within the military to provide diagnosis for large population, which has been adopted by the government. This role of the ROK military in containing COVID-19 has rekindled the previously sporadic discussions on expanding the role of military to address non-traditional threats. 
The core of this matter entails the need to review the impact of new and increasing non-military threats such as COVID-19 on not only the military's readiness but also national security and to explore ways to enhance the military's readiness and expanding the role of the military in supporting the national government. The impact of non-traditional security threats on military and national security is the first issue to ponder. Even without COVID-19, non-traditional security threats such as large-scale natural societal disasters, cybersecurity threats, and terrorism will inevitably become a key area of interest for national security as these threats are becoming increasingly massive, interconnected, and complex in nature, and without Taking a look at these issues, we cannot secure national security. The recent pandemic also showed how even non-traditional security threats can compromise the combat readiness of forces that fail to protect themselves. Such degradation of readiness may in turn prevent the military apparatus from providing the accurate and required deterrence, and therefore it could lead to problems for national security. It is also important to note that the gradual hybridization of military threats today, in other words, it can be predicted that military threats will occur simultaneously, and it may also cause the threats to appear or similar to or even non-distinguishable from non-traditional security threats. The ROK military has also developed responses to emerging non-traditional threats as a part of its inherent mandate. For example, the transnational non-traditional threat of international piracy and cybersecurity is an area where we continue to expand our roles and responsibilities as well as our capabilities. This has prompted that ROK military to establish organizations to better respond to cyber threats and continue developing capabilities to minimize impacts on the national security. And we need to make sure that we look at non-traditional and traditional security threats at the same time. Especially during the initial stages, we could have terror attacks or cyber attacks or even within the military, we could see an outbreak of diseases where we would be required to move the people of the country to escape the damaged areas. In order to prepare for these situations, we, this would be a challenge to modern military today, and therefore we would need to develop various scenarios and strengthen our corresponding response architecture. We also need to support the government. As we have already mentioned, the recent COVID-19 outbreak has drawn the ROK military's attention to its role in providing civil military support for non-traditional security threats during peacetime. Especially during the initial stages, the military is often better postured to combat, to commit trained personnel and resources. And therefore, this recognition has led the ROK military to explore ways to define a more active role for itself in supporting efforts to mitigate the impact of non-traditional threats. However, there are criticism on this initi initiative. These include the negative implications of the military expanding its influence over civilian society, the question of the inherent nature of the military, and the matters of ensuring efficiency and operational readiness. Even with such concerns, the gradual increase of non-traditional security threats, the limitations on the government's ability to appropriate and commit resources, the military's ability to organize and to aforementioned need to prepare against threats do call for more active role of the military in this field. We could contribute to providing better training programs or responses. I would also like to add that concerning the non-traditional security threats, military should also contribute to international efforts. Such cooperation will not only enhance our ability to respond effectively to transnational threats, but also strengthen inter-military communication, promoting greater mutual understanding and trust. These efforts will not only ensure an effective response to various threats, but, but can also be expected to promote international cooperation and strengthen the strategic stability of certain regions. 
Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. No Hoon, President of Kaida Republic of Korea. And really insightful presentation, and especially talked about the uh, role of the military in non traditional security from the perspective of the Republic of Korea. And he talked about, he warned about the ambiguous or gray area for the uh, this non traditional security issues. And he also talked about how Korean uh, military has preemptively prevented the spread of virus in our military units right from the beginning of the outbreak. And actually, we Koreans are witness how much you know, important role the military played. And lastly, he talked about the challenges we have. And one issue he brought up is very interesting because Korea suffered historically, politically, you know, civilian control issues. So if you know, military role increase, heightened with this non-traditional non security, and afraid of how, you know, the penetrating the military influence over Korean politics. That's very interesting and provocative questions. Uh, I, I'm sure that a lot of questions will be asked to him later on in the second or third round. And next, uh, Professor Shin dong Yu is going to present his theme, and the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about cyber security issues in response to non-traditional security threat. Since the COVID-19 pandemic, our lives have changed a lot. The most representative part is that what has been done face-to-face -face in real life has moved to a cyber-based based non-contact method that is called UNTACT. The face-to-face -face service industry, represented by travel, transportation, lodging, and shopping, is gradually declining. And non-contact industries, such as games, online shopping, and video conferencing, are expected to gain more power. Uh, with the advent of COVID-19 in this way, everyday life has quickly shifted to unwanted unprepared, untech-based services. In our society, short-term confusion is inevitable due to the sudden introduction of untech services. There are many challenges to be solved, such as lack of cyber infrastructure and lack of security services that can support these services. Indeed, there have been reports of unhealthy video exposures or outsiders' involvement during meetings while providing remote video services. Most of all, if malicious code is distributed through these systems, a wide range of infections can occur. In addition, the organization's main functions may be stopped due to the leakage of confidential information of the organization or further system failure. In the defense sector, provision of an environment for suitable provision of untaxed service is expected to emerge as an important issue. Given the importance of military operations, countermeasures against leakage of confidential information and service failure due to hacking from inside or unauthorized outsiders should be consulted first. The Korean Air Force's strategically implemented smart wing is also cyber-based. Smart innovation technologies such as virtual reality-based pilot training, maintenance training, and unmanned autonomous driving systems will also fall under this category. A seamless working environment, such as working in an office and the spread of cloud-based services, should be considered first. But it is also necessary to consider cyber security technologies that can stably provide them. Providing authentication services for new non-contact non services and video security technologies, such as intelligent security cameras for threat detection, 
when introducing network security, document security, and on-mend services are examples. Now is the time to think about new services and uh, countermeasures against uh, cyber threat, in preparation in, defense in the defense sector for upcoming year of untech. First, now that the importance of cyber security is emphasized, it is necessary to implement the cyber security cooperation governance system, which is a cooperation system between the government, the military, and the industry. The United States, for example, accounts for 30% of the global security market, and Israel is a cybersecurity powerhouse with five times less gross uh, domestic product than Korea, and three times more sales in the information security industry. The strong cooperation between the government, the military, and the industry was the main reason why these countries could become cybersecurity powers. Second, a cybersecurity strategy that is suitable for Europe untact is needed. Security threat in the Europe untact exists as organization perspective and per personal perspective. From the organization perspective, video conferencing and teleworking are considered as a typical threat. From a personal perspective, security threats such as online lectures, various types of phishing attacks related to non-contact services and fraud are constantly increasing. With the advent of untact society, it is urgent to prepare a security strategy including systems, laws, and regulations as well as a technical aspect to respond to situations in which very security, uh, various security problems may occur. Third, so, a data management strategy is needed. By dualizing the data and, so, data and systems, it is necessary to cope with the situation in which the data center is closed when an infectious disease such as COVID-19 occurs. It is best to have multiple copies of data, and if it is difficult to do so, it is necessary to have dual control over the data. In the future, it seems that the introduction of such an untaxed environment cannot be avoided. After COVID-19, understanding and preparing for new threat through understanding of the cyber environment is a prerequisite to continuously demonstrate the military's cyber security capabilities in the future. Thank you for listening to my presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Shin. A uh, little technical, but I think we have uh, been enlightened by his uh, specialty. And especially talked about the cyber attack and the hacking issues. I think that hit me that, you know, this globalization right before, you know, virus attack, in a way, globalization or marketization, free trade just laid out the highway for this virus to spread out quickly. So if we go to the cyber, you know, online and that we're more vulnerable to non-traditional attack, I think it's, that's why he's, he was talking about the warning sign for cyber uh, security issues. And by the way, an, an, uh, an American professor, I think I want you to answer, one of you to answer, Marcus, is the word untacked is very famous in Korea. Is it word also other country in the US use this word? Because untacked is like a everyday word in Korea. I, I'm really curious about that later on included in to your presentation. Thank you very much. And third, uh, Dr. White and Strategic and Defense Studies Center, Australian National University, Australia. Well, I welcome you and the floor is yours. Well, uh, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to join you from Canberra. I'm very privileged to have the opportunity to share the platform virtually with uh, such a distinguished group. Uh, what I'd like to do in my remarks is to 
um, step back a little bit and think a little bit about the historical and the strategic context in which we think about these non-traditional security threats. It's true that really ever since the end of the Cold War, um, governments around the world, including of course in Asia, have been wrestling with the challenge of adapting our defence postures and forces to the range of non-traditional security threats which came to prominence in the 1990s, whilst at the same time still preserving those forces' capacities to fight what we might call traditional uh, wars facing the traditional um, combat style security threats for which they'd originally been designed. And of course, right at the heart of the way that challenge was addressed by countries around the world, including in Asia, was the recognition that we need to do both, that, that military forces need to be able to respond to the wide range of non-traditional security threats which have always been present and which seemed in the 90s and the decades after to expand. And at the same time, they were convinced that we couldn't, we couldn't allow our armed forces to lose the capacity to fight traditional, symmetrical, state-on-state -state, uh, conflicts should, should they occur because the threat of such conflicts had not disappeared. And now I think in the present moment in history, this challenge remains but has become more and more acute. And it's become more acute, I think, in two ways. The first is that the, the, the significance of those non-traditional security challenges is even greater, is even more apparent to us today than it was in the 1990s. And to take just uh, you know a few examples, uh, obviously, uh, and um, uh, Professor Shin, of course, has spoken about this, the, the issue of cyber security, um, which was hardly considered back in the 90s, has become a major question for countries around the world. And the role of our militaries and our defence organisations in that has become critical. The question of climate change has become really central, of course, to all of our societies. Um, the question of terrorism, which suddenly sort of loomed on the horizon so, so dramatically after 9-11, uh, and continues to be a significant question for us all. And finally, of course, uh, the, the, the pandemic that Dr. No talked about in his remarks. And obviously all of our societies, the very way we're conducting this conversation has been heavily influenced by, by the pandemic and the way in which our armed forces respond to, the, to, to that threat along with all the others has become much, much clearer, much more salient in, in all of our countries. So that's one way in which the challenge has become more acute. But the other way in which the challenge has become more acute is that the risk of traditional conflict has also increased. If we go back to the time in the 1990s where serious people uh, talked about the idea that you know major conflict, state-on-state uh, -state conflict, major power rivalry might be a thing of the past, might have ended with the end of the Cold War, that moment in history has obviously passed. We're now back in a world which is a regrettably very recognisable to earlier generations of analysts and policy makers, a world of, of clear strategic rivalry between major powers and, uh, and, the, and the clear possibility that that strategic rivalry will produce very old fashioned traditional warfare. In my own country, in Australia, for example, our government has recently produced a defence policy update which says very bluntly that the risk of high intensity conflict is now substantially higher than we had imagined it might have been even five years ago. And so whilst we face a whole range of new security threats, which require us to think very carefully about how our armed forces can be designed and constructed to respond to those non-traditional security challenges I've mentioned, we also face a world in which our armed forces must, more than we've contemplated since the end of the Cold War really, focus on how to, on how to fight traditional uh, state-on-state -state conflicts, including state-on-state -state conflicts between really major powers. And I just add a third point, and that is that for us in Asia, at least, there's also uh, that, that anxiety is intensified because the primary strategic rivalry of which we focus, of course, is that between the United States and China. And there is a range of questions within Asia about how confident we in Asia can be of America's future role. We hear the debate, of course, in America about the rise of China and how America should respond. But we also see doubts around Asia. You can see this likewise in Australia about whether the United States will play the role that it's played in the past and that we'd very much prefer it to play in the future. And so that makes for us in Asia 
uh, an even more intense challenge to focus on how our armed forces can deal not just with the non-traditional security threats, but with the traditional ones. Now, what would be nice, of course, would be if we could build armed forces that could do both. If the same sets of capabilities, the same kind of training, the same kind of forces could, could allow our armed forces to respond both to non-traditional security threats and traditional security threats. But unfortunately, that is wishful thinking. The reality is that high intensity conflict imposes very different kinds of demands from the sorts of demands that are faced by responding to non-traditional threats. And th therefore, we do have hard choices to make. We do have to decide to what extent we, 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 um, we build ourselves for non-traditional threats and to what extent we build our forces for traditional threats. And that's a bit of a zero-sum choice we're going to face. And it's also worth noting that that choice is tougher now than it would have been even a year ago because around the world, defence budgets are going to be coming under pressure as the economic and the fiscal consequences of the pandemic, particularly the fiscal consequences of the pandemic for national budgets, when all of our governments have been spending vast amounts of money trying to keep our economies going through the disruption we've all suffered, that is going to make pressure on defence budgets tougher over the years and perhaps even the decades to come. And then finally, of course, there's the fact that, again, as Dr No remarked, that some of these new security challenges pose very distinct problems for our armed forces themselves. And there's perhaps no better example than the pandemic. Uh, clearly, military units are uniquely susceptible to highly infectious diseases. We saw this in the Spanish flu pandemic, of course, at the end of the First World War. And, uh, and but a, a range of these other security challenges, climate change poses very significant challenges to armed forces. Uh, cyber, of course, is a very major issue for armed forces. And uh, so there's a real question about, about how our militaries themselves handle the impact of these non-traditional security threats on themselves, as well as on the society at large. And then there's the way in which these new challenges um, require our armed forces to take on some new and in some ways quite sensitive roles. In, in, in my own country, Australia, for example, where we're not at all used to seeing the military playing a role in policing civil society, um, we've seen the military taking a role, for example, in managing borders between our states in our federal system, uh, blocking us with closing states. And that's, that's a new role and it's a role which has been fulfilled so far with great uh, appropriateness and sensitivity, but it's something which clearly poses a big challenge to the way in which militaries are seen in their role in society. So I want to just finish now by, by, by making three suggestions about how governments and past governments, of course, uh, our, our broader societies should respond to the choices we face about this balance between traditional and non-traditional security. The first is I think it's very important for us to be clear what roles are most efficiently and effectively fulfilled by armed forces and what roles might be better fulfilled or more efficiently fulfilled by other institutions. For example, here in Australia, climate change has produced an increase in the, the number of, of bushfires, forest fires. We call them bushfires in Australia. Last summer, we had a really disastrous summer of bushfires and the military played a significant role in responding to them. Now, there's been, been calls in Australia, understandably, that the military should do more of that. But whether it's really cost-effective for us to use our armed forces for that role, or whether we should spend the same dollars building up civilian bushfire-fighting capabilities, is an important question that Australians are still wrestling with. The second is, that, so we need to be very clear, we don't want to find ourselves using our armed forces for things for which they're not best suited. The second thing is we need to be very clear about what kind of forces we need to meet our traditional warfighting roles. In the post-war era, post-Cold War era, I think it's been relatively easy for defence organisations around the world to be a little bit lax about the way in which they do their military planning and their force planning. It's been easy to acquire capabilities which would look good on the, on the parade ground, so to speak, or good on the fleet review, but wouldn't necessarily contribute cost-effectively to the, to the implementing the key military strategies we're going to need if we find ourselves in an intense conflict. And I think that in Australia's case, for example, we've had big investments in amphibious forces, which although useful in some roles, are probably not going to be much use to us in a high intensity conflict. And I think many other countries face the same challenges. So in order to make sure that we spend our defence dollars efficiently, we're going to, to be very clear, not just about what roles our forces should play in non-security, traditional security threats, 
but also the capabilities we really need for traditional ones. And thirdly, I think it's, it's, going to be, it's going to be very important for governments to communicate more effectively than they have in the past about the choices that have to be made about our future capabilities. When dollars are going to be tight, as they must be as our economies and our fiscal balances recover from the pandemic, when the demands on our military are going to pull us in two different directions, towards non-traditional and towards traditional, then clear communication by governments to their voters, to their electorates, to the taxpayers about how that money is spent and a really disciplined approach to helping the, 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 the taxpayers understand why the money has to be spent is going to be very important. So I think that role of public communication about the appropriate roles for the military and these range of different security challenges is going to be even more important than it has been in the past. I'll close there. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Professor White. I, uh, for, thank you for your insightful presentation. And as I remember, actually, this non-traditional security threat is not new things. We have been hearing this from decade or two decades ago. It's, you know, it's, uh, for example, global agenda versus uh, national agenda or common security or human security. I know it's, it, these words are not interchangeable, but big overlaps yeah. in between these uh, issues. And Dr. White talked about this, you know, traditional security threat also increasing. And especially it's so true because these days not only uh, US-China strategic rivalry, but also this almost militant nationalism rising and strong men and this you know especially after this pandemic they tried to shut down the national borders so so in a way it's like hybrid situation it's not like a phased or next step so this is that's why somebody calls it new normal and you also raised issues that the non-security threat on military themselves and actually dr known uh, talked about uh, raised that issue too, and we can discuss later on. Thank you very much. And next panel list will be Dr. Boniface. I see your floor is yours, please. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, first, I will say that I'm very glad to participate for the third time to the Seoul Defense Dialogue. It's just a pity not to have the opportunity to be in uh, this beautiful city of Seoul, but I'm very glad uh, to be at least in touch uh, by video conference with uh, colleagues and friends. And uh, thanks again for your invitation. And speaking about uh, non-military threats, I would say that uh, because we, we, we spoke about the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, that in France and in Europe, the way South Korea has deal with the pandemic has been really impressive. And uh, when you make a comparison between the number of deaths uh, in your country and in mine, uh, I must admit, I must confess that uh, the way you deal with the pandemic has been really successful and uh, that we, we have to, to make uh, it as an example. And uh, we have uh, to learn from your experience to be able to avoid the famous second wave of uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, coming to the subject, directly the subject, but uh, pandemic is a subject. Uh, Non-traditional security threats can be defined as challenges uh, to the survival and well-being of people and states that arise primarily out of non-military sources, such as climate change, resource scarcity, infectious diseases, natural disasters, irregular migration, food shortages, people smuggling, drug trafficking, and transnational crime. And we call high terrorism because terrorism is a little bit in the middle between military and non-military threat. It's a security threat. It's not exactly a military threat, but uh, we are all witnesses in our country. But right? it's, it's the top of the agenda for a uh, security threat. Of course, with the end of the Cold War, uh, threats to national security have become increasingly non-military in nature. But, and at, it has been told by uh, my colleagues from Australia, the rise of rivalries, uh, uh, especially between US 
and China, we speak uh, sometimes of the new Cold War between these two countries. I don't think it's a reality because it's a different period of time, of history, and uh, China is not at the head of uh, general alliances uh, like the uh, Soviet Union was in the Cold War. But uh, we could see that there is a rise of rivalries between Washington and uh, Beijing, and it's not sure that it will diminish in the future whoever will be the next U.S. president. But if security is generally uh, still viewed in military terms, so-called non-military, non-traditional threats have emerged, and very uh, loudly. Uh, the current uh, undergoing COVID-19 pandemic has reminded us how much these non-traditional threats can pose serious challenges to national security and to international security and reveal critical weaknesses in our defense models. In the French context, the French Strategic Review of Defense and National Security, which has been adopted in 2017, just after Macron election, in every time a new president is coming in France in the recent period, there is a new white paper, so-called white paper on defense. And this uh, strategic review defense identifies the following non-traditional threat as, I quote, likely to foster the emergence of conflict and crisis. The first one is demographic and migration pressure. And we have to remember that in uh, 2015, there is a, a strong crisis, strong migration crisis and refugee crisis in Europe. We have received more than uh, 2 million of people coming mostly from Africa and Middle East. And it has created a huge political debate. And recently, for example, uh, Mrs. Merkel has said that uh, Uh, Germany was able to integrate in a good position one million of uh, refugees and migrants, but we have to remember that uh, this uh, welcome has had for uh, effect, for sad effect, the rise of the far right and of uh, ultra-nationalist forces, not only in Germany, but in world Europe, and has created anti-European uh, movement in Europe. The second, of course, is climate change and the bushfire in Australia, the bushfire in California, uh, the tornadoes and, and so on. And every day we could witness that our, it's, not the, it's not Earth which is at stake, it's humanity, because Earth could survive to uh, degradation. In fact, climate change is not a good expression. We, we must speak about uh, climate degradation. A change could be positive, not a degradation. And uh, the, the way uh, the, the things are going, it's degradation, not change. And of course, it's probably the main threat to humanity. The third one, and of course, with uh, the, the actuality of uh, COVID-19 pandemic, it sent a risk. So who, oh, who could have uh, predict six months from now or uh, eight months from now that the world has stopped. Uh, we are uh, in a world of globalization. Globalization is uh, the contraction of time and uh, of uh, the size of the planet. And we have been touched in three months. Uh, all the world has been unified by uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. And for the first time of history, everybody on Earth every single country fear the same thing because during the war we were not on the same side and with the uh, COVID-19 pandemic even if not the country have reacted in a multilateral way uh, all the world has been uh, um, attacked by uh, the same risk. Energy rivalries and uh, we could witness now in Europe Uh, the struggle between Greece and Turkey, which is mostly about uh, to extract and to, to find oil in the South Mediterranean. Organizing crime, which is still very present, and cyberspace, and we have a good uh, expose on this subject just before. So, analysis of the impact of uh, non-traditional security threats 
on military capabilities and national security. What is uh, the example? And if we took the latest example of a COVID-19 pandemic, we could see that non-traditional security threats can have the following consequences. The first is postponement of military training, because during uh, the pandemic, uh, the training has been postponed. Postponement of uh, military recruitment, because uh, it's uh, not uh, good to uh, gather many people to make a selection and uh, the exams and, uh, of course, the uh, military recruitment has been, have been postponed. Decline of industrial production, uh, all our GDP uh, have been downsized uh, in a very important way and we had some difficulties even at the beginning, because we, uh, we have adapted our situation after. But in the beginning, we have some difficulties to, 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 to have access to food and to many uh, um, goods. Uh, equipments for the military equipments, unavailability, and personal unavailability. And also, uh, slowdown of military engagement abroad. We have seen that in Iraq, for example, the anti-Daesh force has been downsized due just after the pandemic. Maybe there is other uh, reason for, but the pandemic has been uh, the rational explanation to downsize the forces, uh, the Western and Arab forces in Iraq to fight uh, against Daesh. And uh, we could perhaps think about that. Daesh could, be, could have been reinforced during the pandemic because we were not so uh, in a position to fight and our minds have been uh, uh, touched by another phenomena. And uh, to, to make a conclusion, because my, my limit of time is uh, tight, uh, non-traditional and traditional threats overlap. The COVID-19 pandemic has proved that several traditional and non-traditional threats can overlap, such as cyber attacks and targeting hospitals, public institutions, companies, or even individuals, informational warfare, intimidation through missile launches or testing of new weapons, for example, at his, as happened March 22, and um, also uh, attack on, for example, Paris Hospital, state assistance uh, has been hit by a cyber attack. So we have in a world, in a multidimensional world, in which uh, both traditional and non-traditional security threats have emerged, and unfortunately, we could not say that the emergence of uh, non-traditional security threats have put an end to the traditional security threats. There is still many worse uh, and crises. Uh, we have at least uh, 40, 30, 40 crises uh, in the world, and we have still some uh, warfare and uh, re re real wars, and we have to, to, to raise both issues and to fight uh, in the same way traditional and non-traditional security threats. And the role of military is very important and I'm very impressed by the first uh, speech. Of course, civilians must uh, stay in power. Civilians must uh, be the leader of both non-traditional non and traditional security threats. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Director Boniface. Uh, you talked a lot about the seriousness of um, non-security, uh, non-traditional security uh, threats, especially you talked about the climate change and the human energy issue too. And also these days, you know, France is kind of very noticeable to gather, to try to gather the international cooperation. I think this COVID-19 is is a good test case for how the international community uh, deal with this non-traditional security threat. And I think a European um, example is, can be, we we'll still wait and see, but can be a good example how, you know, multilateral cooperation can provide, especially, uh, you know, countries are really not equipped to deal with this disease. 
And finally, but not the least, and Dr. Collison, you are the presenter now. Thank you very much, and thank you for the kind invitation to, uh, to be with you today. It's a wonderful opportunity. Uh, my career was in military medicine uh, in the United States Navy for almost 40 years, so most of my comments will be relative to healthcare. Uh, as Professor Boniface just mentioned, we're all in a global conflict with a common enemy, and that enemy is the virus that causes COVID-19. So what does this mean to military preparedness and operations? As was mentioned, recruitment, training, exercises, and deployments all face challenges which put mission readiness at risk. So let's start with recruiting and training. I don't know how many of you have been to boot camp, but social distancing, two meters of interpersonal face, is not part of any boot camp I've ever been uh, part of. United States Service has met this challenge by stopping or delaying training for a period, testing and isolating recruits for about two weeks prior to training, and then further isolating those potentially infected. Access to training commands by outsiders is extremely limited, and it remains to be seen how successful these measures will be, but the United States basic training centers are up and running. Military exercises around the globe, including here in Korea, have been downsized, shortened, or canceled. The risk of disease must be balanced against the benefits of the exercise. Even if training can be modified from a field to a tabletop or virtual exercise, readiness will likely suffer to some degree. What impact does COVID have on forward deployed units? Normally about one third of the US Navy is deployed at any given time around the world. Social distancing aboard ship is nearly impossible. Mask use, surface cleaning and hand washing can be enforced and port calls can be avoided. One ship was at sea for almost 300 days, yet sailors still get sick. In the well-publicized case of the aircraft carrier USS Roosevelt, a deployment was interrupted in mid-March this year when over 1,200 crew members, including the captain, tested positive for COVID. After the ship was thoroughly cleaned, potentially infected crew members isolated and treated, <clears throat> and more stringent preventive measures put in place, Roosevelt continued its deployment, and no member of the crew tested positive during the last 35 days prior to returning to its home port in San Diego, California. Lessons learned from the Roosevelt episode would quickly put into practice when a COVID case was diagnosed aboard another ship the following month. Subsequently, the Navy instituted pre-deployment pre testing and restriction of movement policies now in common to all the militaries. Although more COVID cases are to be expected and have occurred in spite of these precautions, deployments have continued. So how does COVID-19 affect military medicine? First, let me say the Republic of Korea COVID response provide many lessons in how to do things right. The pandemic is both at home and everywhere military forces might deploy. In the United States, military medical teams have balanced requests to support civilian medical centers while maintaining health services at their home installations. In the midst of all this, the priority remains to ensure a healthy, fit, and capable force capable of meeting security commitments around the globe. This requires effective medical research, preventive medicine, public health, trauma expertise, intensive care capabilities, and rehabilitation services, to just name a few. As Professor White mentioned a few minutes ago, we are expected to do it all, uh, both uh, normal threats and, and unusual threats. Throughout history, military health professionals have saved many lives through humanitarian assistance and disaster relief activities. In normal times, this usually means deploying from a secure home base with fully operational health capabilities, such as in the 2013 to 2016 West African Ebola outbreak. This was an excellent example of international military support of civil authority in accordance with the Oslo guidelines. The world needs a vaccine. Military medical researchers have a long, proud history of vaccine development, and today they work in concert with civilian institutions and manufacturers in the search for a safe and effective SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. And as I mentioned in the beginning, and as Professor Boniface just mentioned, all nations face the same disease. Everybody wants to protect their citizens, and this is the time that nations can easily turn inward, but the world best benefit from international cooperation. I encourage continuing commitments of funding and participation and existing effective international health frameworks 
such as the global health security agenda, an agreement designed to improve all nations' ability to prevent, detect, and respond to public health emergencies of international concern in accordance with the international health regulations. The Republic of Korea, United States, Japan, China, and I'm sure Australia and France are among the 69 GHSA signatories. Especially when international relations are strained, positive working relationships among military health professionals are vital. It is important to know and understand each other's policies and procedures. But success or failure depends on how individuals interact. Interpersonal relationships matter probably more than anything else. I encourage international military health engagement with near neighbors. This can be facilitated through bilateral exercises and conferences and sidebar meetings at professional conferences <clears throat> through regularly scheduled established forums, such as the U.S. Indo-Pacific Command's Asia-Pacific Military Health Exchange attended by over 30 Indo-Pacific countries. Korea co-hosted the precursor to this meeting in 2009. The next is being planned for New Delhi, India in 2021. And finally, I've been told by my colleagues at U.S. Forces Korea about the tremendous support they've received from the Republic of Korea Armed Forces, the Korean CDC, civilian healthcare organizations, including the timely processing of numerous laboratory specimens. This relationship is a model for the world to emulate. Thank you for your kind attention, and I look forward to the discussion. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Carlson. Uh, uh, thank you for the compliments uh, about Korea's uh, disease control issues. And I think you're right. I think really important and you know to, to share the information among countries because this situation, in a way, uh, so every day is a new 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 kind of uh, problems. And until everybody's safe, nobody's safe. I think that's important. And also in you introduced the Roosevelt uh, carrier case. I think it's, it's a, it's a, it was uh, serious, but I think it can be a model for the next, and uh, uh, the method, how to deal with those issues. And you also talked about the, this is uh, non-traditional security issue itself is, is directly related to, is, is a threat to individual, human, so I think, it, at the same time, we are in the nation or in the military, but this problem is directly toward targeting the human themselves. I think we had a great uh, one first round of presentation and we raised so many issues. Why don't we do this way? Because we uh, listened uh, to all the presentation, I raised some issues. So why don't we kind of uh, give like a two, three minutes. So if you cannot present and you're missing, and, but you still want to uh, edit, or you raise the issue that other presenters issue and um, you agree or disagree, or you want to highlight on things like that. So why don't we start the reverse order? Dr. Kalisson, you again. Well, thank you. Uh, I, I mentioned, uh, in the discussion of uh, military medical research, and I, I just wanted to throw out several topics for, for possible discussion later, but the international collaboration in vaccine research is highly important. The World Health Organization, uh, CEPI, which is a world organization based on uh, vaccine creating uh, creation, and GAVI, which is an organization that has to do with vaccine implementation around the world, are all working with researchers and every country that has major medical uh, research capability, not, mili not necessarily military, but mainly civilian. The big question now is, does the world cooperate on creating a vaccine or does the world compete in, in creating a vaccine? Do the rich countries buy what they need and let everybody else spend for themselves? Or does the world somehow make a vaccine available to everyone? And the structure is out there for the latter to occur. And I certainly hope that, uh, that this is the choice that the world makes and how to approach this disease because as Professor Boniface says, it is everybody's problem. Mm -hmm. And do, do you think it's, this vaccine issue is politicized and you know, the issue of distribution even after the, you know, they invented this vaccine? You think it's, you know, European country as a kind of, a, you know, have cooperate to do that, but especially 
uh, U.S. and China is more, as you said, is more like competitions. So, what do you think about that? What is your opinion on that? Well, uh, my my opinion is there's competition, but I would like to see cooperation. Uh, <laughs> okay. China uh, uh, decoded the DNA for the virus in the first place, made that available to the world. Korea used that to develop uh, testing capabilities. Uh, other countries did the same. Uh, when it comes to using that kind of information for scientific research, it's fairly easy to cooperate. When it comes to having enough uh, vaccine to take care of the population of the country for which you're responsible, that's where the competition would come. And this, is, this will be, in my estimation, a test for international organizations to figure out how to make this work so that the developed countries aren't the only ones that, uh, that are treated. It's really in everybody's interest to have the entire world vaccinated because, as we've already seen, if the disease occurs anywhere, it occurs everywhere. And so it must be brought under control on a worldwide basis. The money needs to be spent to create a new vaccine to, to vaccinate the world. And time is of the essence. So I wish I, I wish I could have a crystal ball and tell you which way it's going to go, but I would vote for cooperation. Okay. Before I go to uh, uh, Dr. Boniface, actually, I have a qu one more question for uh, for you. Uh, we talked about the the, the scale downing of uh, you know Korea, U.S. Korea military exercise. That was a big issue here too, and it, the Okan transfer issue is related to. So do you think it's, it's the best or optimum uh, uh, method to deal with this? Is it, is it better at this time? Is it reduced or no exercise? Or how to then next year, how to uh, you know, make up that? Yeah, I, I don't think you're going to make up what you lose. But that, that's a decision that needs to be made for each individual exercise, the risk-benefit uh, ratio. Just like the uh, use the aircraft carrier example, if there was a real crisis the ship needed to sail to, it would have gone ahead and, and met its mission, even if 20% of the crew is sick. It's just what they do. Uh, most exercises are testing capabilities in one way or another, and the necessity for that test balanced again against the... Uh, illness and the, the threat to the people involved is one that needs to be made on a case-to-case -case basis. So I, I can't give you a blanket answer to that, but probably the right answer is to back off on exercises when, uh, when we can and try to figure out how to take a field exercise and use a tabletop or a virtual exercise to, to do as, be as best you can with it. Okay, thank you. And next, uh, Director Boniface. Uh, yes, uh, I, I will jump on uh, Tom's uh, remarks because it's very important. And first, we, I, I will speak about multilateralism. And we could see that the difference, per, perhaps on, uh, for sure, between uh, traditional military threats and non-traditional military threats are multilateralism. Because uh, it's sure that multilateralism is not always a good response to traditional military threats. But it is the only one to non-traditional military threats. Every challenge, uh, what I've mentioned, demographic uh, pressure, uh, climate change, sanitary risk, could be only solved by a multilateral approach. If we try to have a national approach, it will be a failure. And of course, the pandemic does not know boundaries. And, uh, and so if you have a good sanitary policy in your own country, but, but if your neighbor has not the same, of course you will be, uh, will be rich by the pandemic. And speaking about vaccine, and of course there is a competition uh, on, for national pride. Who will be the first to discover the good vaccine? Uh, Putin has said that uh, Russia has found uh, a new vaccine. We know that there is a huge competition between China and United States also in vaccine. But so it's not a problem because national pride could be a good thing if it's a, an engine to, to, to progress. But after, once the vaccine will be discovered, it will be declared immediately as a worldwide public good. And so it could be given, it should be given to everybody on earth uh, for free, uh, 
because, of course, it's not possible uh, to have a country in a good shape if the other has an uh, attack by illness. And in fact, in the Western world, we are in France and in Europe at the beginning, when uh, the crisis uh, has a blast uh, in China and in Asia, many people in Europe have said that, oh, of course, pandemic, it's only for Africa or Asia. We, are, uh, we, we could not be rich by a disease uh, this way. And we have witnessed that we have been uh, attacked by the disease. So I think that uh, uh, COVID-19 pandemic, it's another proof that uh, in a global world, multilateralism is not an option. It is an obligation. Uh, thank you very much. I have a, one more question for you. Yeah, you talked about this, you know, national approach, just individual national approaches is a, what can be a fatal but without international cooperation. But these days, this, you know, with talking about this competition or nationalism, you know, it, this pandemic issue and other non-traditional uh, security threat is really hard to solve. So that means without, your, you know, cooperation, this, what happened is easily happen is blaming game. You know, it's, it's going on between China and U.S. about this pandemic, whose responsibility issues. So, you know, we normatively we agree that cooperation should be there to solve the problem. But at the same time, it's too hard, too too difficult to solve uh, right away. So it's tempted to blame mm. other yeah. country. How to overcome that? Yeah, because for national reason, it's a. Uh it's always useful to have a scapegoat and uh, to say that uh, I'm not guilty for, it's the other who, 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 who are guilty, but we know that it's not a solution. It's a short-term answer. It's not a long-term answer. And in the, let's, uh, let's back to Europe. At the beginning, even in, among the 27 members of the European Union, the first answer has been national. And even the boundaries between France and Germany have been closed. But just after, we realized that we need to have a common approach to the pandemic. And we have uh, changed our policy to, to have a huge plan of uh, economic, sanitary answer. And so if the first reflex is to find a national repentance, and the second one could be to blame the other, uh, to be responsible for what is going badly. Uh, at the end, if we want to really cope with the situation, we just see that uh, only the cooperation is and uh, only multilateralism is the way. And in fact, the COVID-19 pandemic has proven that oh, multilateralism is useful and oh, multilateralism is in crisis because we have a huge crisis of multilateralism uh, in, in nowadays. And that's, uh, of, I think that it's also one of the reasons of uh, uh, the spread of the pandemic. Thank you very much. Uh, next, uh, Dr. White, uh, you, you wanna add something on it or you wanna uh, raise the issue? Yes, look, uh, thank you. It's been a very uh, rich discussion uh, already. I just want to touch on three points. The first is to reinforce how in interesting and important I think the points that uh, Dr. Collinson made about the impact of the pandemic itself on our capacity to sustain our military capabilities. Mm -hmm. I thought, you know, his point about boot camp was very well taken. And across the board, I think we're facing real challenges uh, in maintaining our military capabilities in the face of the pandemic. And I think we need to be very careful about how that echoes through uh, the years and decades to come. That's, I think, going to be a, an ongoing problem. The second is to pick up on the point that uh, Dr Boniface made, just made about the importance of international collaboration. And to just sound a bit of a warning, particularly here in Asia, um, exactly as, as, uh, the, as he said, uh, in non-traditional security threats, international cooperation is the key and of course when we in Asia look at Europe and see that dense network of cooperation amongst the countries of Europe which has been built up uh, in the decades since the Second World War and since the Cold War 
um, you know, we can see how far individual nation states can go to build their capacity to cooperate and how far we still are in Asia from that. And I do worry, and we can see some of this in the competition we've seen around uh, coming out of the pandemic, I do worry that the, that the international context and, and willingness for cooperation in meeting non-traditional security threats is declining as strategic rivalry grows. And the third point is, is just to touch on the point of the grey zone, that uh, whilst in my own presentation I stressed the difference between traditional and non-traditional security threats, it is true that a very important piece of the territory is in the grey zone between them. And, for example, in cyber, we face cyber challenges that are clearly non-traditional security threats when, for example, uh, uh, transnational criminals are using uh, cyber means to achieve their objectives and in the cyber systems of countries. And then there's the high end where cyber becomes part of a traditional military conflict as one side starts tries to undermine or degrade the cyber systems of the other as a way of attacking their armed forces. And then in between, there's the potential that cyber attack is used to achieve what are essentially strategic effects by national governments, but below the level of conflict. And I think that's one of the reasons why cyber is going to be one of the fields where the challenge for international cooperation is going to be especially hard and especially important. So I think they, that one of the things that governments should really focus on is trying to get past the sense of competition and rivalry in the cyber domain, which is so much a part, of, so much a growing part of our environment at the moment, and, and really build up that international cooperation on the cyber fr front. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I have a, a follow-up question for you. You talked about it, it's very interesting. You you raised the issue of a gray zone. And this pandemic, even pandemic, is everybody's agreed that we have to control this disease. But even in this, you know, some ideological or national, you know, difference involved, maybe cl climate control is less ideological. But for example, cyberspace, you talked about it, very sensitive. And this is related, deeply related to, to strategic rivalry. So how in a way, it's, it's, you, you talked about diversification of this, you know, threats and the, the, the larger, getting larger, the size is getting larger, scale uh, getting larger. So how you differentiate or prioritize this and I think it's, it's critical. So. Yes, look, it's a really important, it's a really important point. And again, I, I, I don't like to sound pessimistic, but I think we do have to be aware of how much harder the environment is becoming for international cooperation, even on issues like climate change, which, as you mentioned in your question, you'd think would be one of the most natural areas in which, so to speak, we're all in this together. But, you know, if you look back, for example, at the policies of the Obama administration, it was pretty clear that one of the reasons why the Obama administration was reluctant to allow the sense of strategic rivalry with Beijing to escalate too far was Barack Obama's determination, I think himself personally, to ensure that nothing got in the way of his desire to be able to cooperate with Beijing in confronting climate change. Whereas if we look at the state of US-China relations today, we'd have to be much more pessimistic about chances of those two countries being able to cooperate even on an issue like climate change, where their two, where their respective interests, you'd think, are so closely aligned, and I think, you know, going back to the points that the Dr. Cullison made about uh, about the balance between competition and cooperation on uh, in relation to the pandemic and the development of vaccines and so on, uh, we we have seen in some respects, in some aspects at least, of the rhetorical response, the way in which. To the, to the pandemic, the way in which uh, political figures in Washington have described it as the China virus and so on. We have seen a, a bit of a sense that that too, again, a very much, a, as Professor Bonifay said, very much a, a problem we all face together. We all face the same enemy. But uh, the sense of increasing strategic rivalry in the traditional sense is, I think, eroding our capacity to cooperate Mm -hmm. in this non-traditional security front. And that's not perhaps a reason for despair, but it is a reason to be very conscious of the rising challenge and to press even harder to make sure that we don't let this strategic rivalry get out of hand. And that poses a big challenge to our political leadership, 
um, and for that matter to our strategic communities to make sure that whilst we focus on the strategic questions in a traditional way, we don't let ourselves lose sight of how fundamental cooperation is going to be in managing these big security challenges. Thank you very much. And uh, we have uh, Professor Shin dong -gyu. Yeah. Yes. Uh, sorry, uh, I speak in Korean. Okay. okay. Uh, cyber threats are in important for non-traditional threats, but also they are related to traditional security threats. If military services are provided in a non-contact manner, then such cybersecurity threats will become even more important. Uh, at this point in time, in the military, we don't have much coverage of cybersecurity. But as you may know, uh, troops are gathered together in close proximity while many companies are, are allowing their employees to work at home. So there is a big difference from the between the military and the civilian society. And we need to have a discussion on what the military has to do in dealing with non-contact um, environment. Currently, the main command is being computerized, but going forward in the future, if all the military uh, services and functions are becoming digital, then what should we do to prevent and deter uh, cyber attacks? And in such a case, we will have to transform our command systems and the entire framework. And this is something that we need to discuss further. I have a follow-up question. You pointed out something very important. Now we are discussing cybersecurity threats, and uh, cybersecurity issues can be very sensitive and important to the military. And at the same time, there are cybersecurity concerns in the society and in the country as a whole. So do you think that we need a nationwide framework for cybersecurity first before we adopt something uh, about cybersecurity framework for the military first? So which has to be done first? Do you think the military has to take the lead or if uh, that's going to be possible? I think we need both. As I mentioned in the initial remarks, we need a cyber a security governance system that includes both the government, the military, the industries, and other institutions. In the civilian sector, we have many technologies, and they are sometimes adopted by the military. But there are many areas where we need special military specialized technologies and, and innovations. So once again, we need a collaborative framework where the government, the military, and private institutions can collaborate. For instance, in the military, we need a cyber command system. And it includes many different functions. Um, and we do have some uh, civilian experts who are working to improve our cyber command chain. And uh, there are many civil experts who have some military exposure and experiences. I, I think we need to um, improve our framework to, to defend that. You know, yeah, obviously, interaction between the military and the, and the private company or government, uh, I think is desirable, but at the same time, it's, what's the reality? Which has a more capacity and the, which is desirable from, from military to society or society to, to military? Let me, uh, yeah, I'll keep that in mind and it's just put in, in when you answer other questions. The finally, and yeah, President, no. <laughs> 예, 그 세... Thank you very much for this very interesting dialogue. Having listened to the dialogue, I would like to share with you two things. First is related to what Dr. Boniface has mentioned. He had defined 
the vision, and I believe that that is very uh, appropriate. His definition of non-traditional security threats was quite appropriate. Having said that, I think the issue of scoping is the next issue that we have to take a look at. He also talked about multilateralism. In order to have international cooperation, we need to have a common understanding of key issues. That common understanding would be the basis of international cooperation. We continue to talk about non-traditional security threats throughout the morning, including COVID-19. For climate change, it is a global issue, but each country may have a different position. I think someone also talked about refugees as well. In the case of Asia, the issue of refugees is quite different from what you see in Europe. From time to time, there are also economic issues tied to non-traditional security threats, such as poverty. And when that poverty is involved, then the response by advanced countries and underdeveloped countries could be different as well. So in conducting international cooperation, how are we going to group the different scope of threats? And how can we group like-minded countries for each issue is a very difficult issue. According to what the best of my knowledge, ARF has also discussed non-traditional security threats, but their scoping and definition still remains quite superficial. And so I hope that we can continue to develop these issues. The second point that I would like to make is that the core issue of today is how the military can play a role in non-traditional security threats. Concerning non-traditional security threats, if the military can provide support, then it would be common knowledge that the military should provide support where necessary and where support can be provided. But as Dr. White has mentioned, they are not used to seeing the military policing the borders between states. And so the intervention of the military could be sensitive amidst the situation. If the military were to play a role, we would need to decide what would be the appropriate role. And in order to decide that, then we would have to decide that a non-traditional security threat is a threat that is an urgent threat and that we would have to have standards in place that would trigger the participation of the military. This would also be related to how the society would tolerate the intervention of the military and also about the cost effectiveness, as Dr. White has mentioned. There could be various perspectives concerning this, but I think we need to first work with the issue of what the military would be good at. That would also be another issue on itself. In the case of France, to the best of my knowledge, there is a military group that is dedicated to responding to disasters as a part of non-traditional security threats. I don't know if that is still true. If Could Dr. Boniface discuss whether there is a current military organization in France dedicated to disasters. I don't know if he can discuss this in his capacity. If there is such an organization, how can the military effectively and efficiently play a role in various non-traditional security threats? I look forward to a more in-depth discussion. For uh, Director Fonifas, you have a, okay. a kind of task force Yes, there is several. In fact, you, first you have a, a civil protection uh, and firemen, and but they have a military training by the fact, and some are civilian, other are military, and uh, the firemen in France are uh, we, we, you have civilian and you have military, and uh, and uh, inside uh, the military uh, units, uh, of course, uh, 
uh, we are trained, the military uh, unit in France are trained to intervene uh, in case of uh, civil disaster, natural disaster. And um, to, to, and it uh, happens uh, frequently. And uh, we, the, the farm and the, what we call sapper pompier uh, are very uh, trained. And um, they, they, in, in case, for example, of uh, 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 natural uh, uh, catastrophe uh, in the world, France is able to send uh, on the spot uh, this force to help uh, other countries to uh, recover and uh, to to find uh, uh, survivors and, and so on. So we, we we are used to it. It's true that we have a very specialized unit, which is uh, which uh, capacity uh, is recognized uh, worldwide. Thank you, Marisha. I want to go back to to, uh, to Dr. Dohun. And uh, you mentioned two very interesting points. Not only would there be differences between countries, but also issues between advanced countries and underdeveloped countries. I think Korea could play a bridging role as a middle power country. And so could you comment on this? And within your presentation, you also mentioned that we have always seen the military participating in natural disasters. For example, when there's a flood, we would mobilize the military. So mobilization has happened for a very long time. But what about a more proactive role by the military, for example, leading the intervention after disasters? Do you think that would be appropriate, or would it be of, be of concern to the society because of our history? Well, let me answer the second question first. Concerning non-traditional security threats, uh, we did listen to some historical background. So ever since the 90s, after the end of the Cold War, we have been discussing non-traditional security threats. And the discussion was quite active in the 90s. MOTW was established in the US so that they can develop the military intervention related to non-traditional security threats. But we see that even after the Cold War, conflicts did continue. Even now, we talk about a new Cold War. And we have seen wars in the recent history. And we seem to be less interested in non-traditional security threats in the military. But now it's back in the limelight. In the case of Korea, for other countries, they are at peace and they are already past the Cold War. But in the case of Korea, we are a little bit different. As you're well aware, we are still experiencing tensions between the two Koreas and our interest in traditional security threats is very high. And so we have not been able to pour interest into non-traditional security threats. As our moderator has mentioned, when there is a disaster, sometimes we need to mobilize military forces because we need manpower. And we believe that it is something that we need to do. But in France, there's a dedicated military group. But in Korea, we don't have a mechanism that is dedicated to disasters. Maybe we can think that the situation is different now for various reasons. For example, the military tension on the Korean Peninsula may be relaxed a bit. Uh, people have different opinions. But aside from this, I believe that the impact of non-traditional security threats are much higher than ever before. and. These threats can not only impact society overall, but it also impacts the military. I talked about how we have multifaceted threats and also massive threats. So for example, if a threat impacts the military, then and if the military is affected, 
then the military will be in a position where it is inevitable to play a much more important role because it is impacted. In disaster situations, how do we distinguish disasters with terrorism? Of course, conceptually, there is a division. But in actual situations, if there's a large fire, are we sure that it is not an act of terrorism? Or are we sure that it is a natural fire that has happened? And so, what brings us to decide whether this event impacts military strategies, that situation could be quite gray. And so that is why my position is that we need to be relatively more proactive in these situations than compared to the present. The first question that you asked was on Korea's role in multilateralism. Well, if Korea could play a role, I believe that as a middle-income country, we can work with the bridging of the awareness of non-traditional security threats possessed by advanced countries and underdeveloped countries. And so we could bridge the gap in the awareness and understanding. And as I have already mentioned before, Korea is experiencing traditional security threats. And at the same time, we are in a position where we inevitably have to look at non-traditional security threats. So I believe that we can help others in similar positions. I think that could be the role of Korea. Some friends, you are, have a, you can jump in any time. You can uh, signal me. And, uh, okay. All right. Um, so I raised this question in you know, the north-south divide also applies to, to this you know, non-traditional security issue, in my opinion. Because this pandemic actually kind of uh, back and forth, you know, southern hemisphere and northern hemisphere. At the same time, you know, the southern hemisphere is, is going to suffer so much because if they're not that generally not very equipped to deal with this pandemic. So, and, you know, 1994, UN, you know, uh, declared this human security issue is a big threat to humankind. But it wasn't really well accepted by this South because there are so many conditions attached. So do you think it's the future cooperation in the international community will face the same problem? Uh, or any, anyone who have a thought on that, or should I go to Dr. White? Uh, yes. Look, um, I, I do think that, uh, the the different perspectives that different countries have on these issues, depending on their level of development, is a really critical factor. And uh, you know, we can we can see that at work on many issues. Climate change, of course. Um, uh, most obviously, the capacity of international community to cooperate in responding to climate change has been very strongly shaped by the perspective that the the north, the old um, developed world has been primarily responsible for putting so much carbon in the atmosphere, so why should developing countries inhibit their economic growth in order to support it? But I think, uh, and this goes back to something that, that, that uh, Professor Boniface said, one of the interesting and intriguing things about the pandemic is that whereas um, the developed world, the north, the global north might have believed that it was less susceptible to uh, pandemic uh, than, than the global south, would have been because of more sophisticated uh, health systems and so on, that has not proved to be the case, or at least has not proved to be the case so far, that very developed countries, um, countries in Europe, the United States, obviously, even to a certain extent Australia, have been much more seriously affected than we had expected. And so I think in some ways the pandemic might, uh, might help to, 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 rebalance, to rebalance that. The other point I'd make is that the old north-south distinction has has been significantly eroded by the way in which wealth and power is being redistributed globally anyway. I and mean, in a sense, 
the idea of the global north and the global south very much reflected the old sort of industrial revolution era idea that there were a group of countries that were industrialized and developed with high per capita incomes and a, lot, and, a, and a much bigger group of countries that hadn't made those steps and had much lower per capita incomes. And I guess the most important underlying long-term trend we've seen in the last few decades has been the way in which uh, not just countries like South Korea, obviously, and very spectacularly, but China and India in their different ways to different degrees, but also potentially down the track, countries like Nigeria, uh, Brazil, of course, have started to have achieved economic growth, which has started to level out the distribution of uh, wealth and power globally. And so I think one of the things we're going to find is that not perhaps yet, but in the decades to come, the north-south distinction is going to be less useful in analysing these things. And uh, potentially, at least, regionalism will become more important, that, that, that there'll be an African perspective on these issues and an East Asian perspective on these issues and a European perspective on these issues. And that won't necessarily make those distinctions easier to manage, as we touched on before, the contest between uh, the US and China, uh, the tensions between e Europe and Russia. Um, these are making these questions harder to manage in some ways. So I I'm not so sure that a world that is divided regionally rather than so to speak, um, it, economically, is going to be an easier one to manage, but it will require different kinds of mechanisms to do so, I think. Uh, thank you very much. I, I think this pandemic uh, uh, era also is related to this issue of, you know, the, the state. Many, many people pointing out that state, is return, state has returned. Because these privatizations and globalization, in a way, push the state on the, off the on the bay, and when pandemic came, so more authoritarian or a strong state looks like deal with this issue, uh, this this uh, disaster more efficiently. Looks like more efficiently, and Western countries are unexpectedly are not handling this uh, crisis very well. So this competition of uh, uh, system or regime, especially between the US or Western and, and the China. <clears throat> In Korean case, actually, you know, bo had a both side. We have a strong uh, civil society after the democracy days. At the same time, because we have a history of war, colonizations, and then divide is especially divide division of of the nation so we have a strong public sectors including military so in a way it's a better equipped but at the same time many western some uh, uh, philosophers worry about you know penetrating into individual life but we try to keep this principle of democracy transparency accountability but let me ask this question uh, by turning a little bit to Dr. Collison. And US actually has been suffering from it. I think military actually may be one and only and good, efficient public sectors. So is it desirable or did the military should more involved or help this issue? So, so set the model for this non traditional security threat. Yeah, thank you. But in the United States has a very long tradition of an apolitical military which is controlled by civil society. And that, that's one of the uh, tenets to which we hold most dearly. Uh, historically, at least since the Vietnam War, the military has been one of the most uh, positively uh, appreciated organizations inside the United States. Uh, the issue of disaster response by the military came up. In the United States, each of our 50 states has a National Guard, which is a, a militia, basically, that is under the control of the state governor, which can be used for disaster response. It can also be nationalized and become part of the Army or the Air Force for overseas combat, should they be needed. So it's kind of a transitional force. For the U.S. military to be used in disaster response inside the United States requires that no other capability that we have can deal with the issue, and the state governor needs to ask the president 
to give the authority to use the military inside the United States, and that's done very rarely. Uh, some of our major hurricanes, I mentioned uh, the, some of the military medical folks that are working in civilian hospitals around the country as backup, but that's a very rare event in our, uh, in our experience. Uh, I was afraid somebody was going to ask me about the election, and my answer would be, I spent 40 years in the military. I've dodged that question for 40 years, so don't ask me today uh, <laughs> our election coming up. Uh, all I'll say is that it, it's, it's a very emotionally, uh, this has more interest than any election I think I've seen in our history, uh, is the one which is coming up in November, and I'll, I'll leave it at that. Uh, so should the military be involved? No, not inside the country with rare exception. I mentioned the Oslo Accords, the Oslo Agreements, and what I wanted to ask and what I wanted to approach was the question of whether international organizations, <clears throat> traditional alliances like NATO and the various uh, um, treaties the United States has with Australia, Japan, Korea, the Philippines, and so on, Thailand, uh, whether those, those structures are capable of answering the questions we're coming up with today. Uh, I mentioned in vaccine development some of the international structure that had been created around the World Health Organization, a UN organization, uh, to hopefully speed up the development of vaccine and make it available throughout the world. I'm personally not sure that we have the right international structures in place and that they can answer the questions when we come to the question of state sovereignty versus international collaboration through structures that have been created, be it the European Union, be it NATO, be it uh, ASEAN, uh, whatever they are, be it the United Nations and all of its organizations, they all work, they all work by consensus pretty much. And they all work in the self-interest of the parties that are a piece of those organizations. Do we have the right structures in place to really make this work? I, I don't know. And uh, I think the vaccine development will be a real test case for how this goes. Uh, can, it be, can it be created in a cooperative way? Can it be shared throughout the world in a way that makes the most sense to treat the most people and, and um, defeat the disease? I, you asked me the question earlier, and I just don't know the answer to that, and I'd be interested in other people's thoughts. Uh, thank you very much. I actually agree with you about uh, you know, how, we, uh, how other uh, well, the countries uh, react when the vaccine is available, it's cooperation over competition. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and one more questions to, to uh, Director Vonifas. You know, we are about this, the, the middle power issue, somebody don't, don't, some people don't like this, the term middle power, but middle power was uh, recognized as a size-based concept but these days, you know, in some people pointed out the Z, G0, not the G2. So, so because of the strategic rivalry, so this middle power or, you know, second tier strong countries should cooperate, especially in this uh, non, you know, traditional security. It's at the same time, try to mediate this strategic rivalry between the U.S. and China. So that's why I think it's one of the example is France and, and also Germany or Canada, Australia, these countries, and including Korea. Is there any area, especially this, this uh, non-traditional security issue, I think can be a building blocks for that. What are you, what's opinion, your opinion about that? <clears throat> First of all, in France and in Europe in general, we don't want to be to have as the only choice to be the junior partner of uh, either USA or China. And we want to have uh, our own way and not to be uh, involved in a new Cold War because I think it's a huge mistake to these rivalries, these growing rivalries. <coughs> and we, we don't want to be obliged to make a choice. Of course, we have an alliance with USA. As a Western country, we share the political system, but uh, we must admit that time to time, USA uh, are not uh, a so good ally and uh, they want to impose us uh, something. And so um, we don't want to, 
to be obliged to choose, and we want to have a contact both with China and, and cooperation, both with China and USA on, on some uh, issue. Uh, in fact, uh, regarding, for example, the Iranian nuclear issue, uh, European position are closer to China position than to US position, even if uh, we share with USA democratic system. And uh, regarding, uh, coming to, to your question, of course, we, 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 we see that uh, um, speaking about the Chinese virus and to, to, to close uh, the, the, the national, the Trump reaction to COVID-19 has not been uh, the good one, uh, never for his own country, nor for the world. And to cut, for example, if, even if we have some things to, to criticize, some uh, reason to criticize the World Health Organization, to cut the fund, to the funds uh, during the crisis has been a huge mistake, which has only helped China to extend its own influence inside the organization. So I think that regarding these rivalries, which will probably be the big strategic challenge for the years to come, uh, the other countries, both European and Asian, uh, need to create a new alliance, an alliance of multilateralism. Because uh, I think we have, of course, a, a main difference between a democratic system and non-democratic system. Uh, as you have told, I don't think that the North-South division is so important as it was. And in fact, there is no more third world. Third world has exploded in many uh, cases. And one of the mistakes of the Western world is not to realize that the Western world has lost the monopoly of power he has enjoyed uh, during five centuries. And uh, we, the Western world is no longer, uh, the, has no longer the monopoly of power. And, uh, and so we need to share uh, the policy to, to share uh, views and to, to find a multilateral approach. And so I think that's a, uh, one of the uh, future line of division between countries is the one who will have a real and not only a declaratory uh, multilateral policy and the one who prefer to have a unilateral policy. Thank you very much. I think it's, we have only 15 minutes left. I thought it's, so two hours are a very long time at the beginning, but already passed a lot. I think we have a final round. Before you, uh, uh, you know, present final comments, uh, let me introduce some of questions online. So you can pick what you want to answer. You don't have to answer everything. So, okay, first question I want to raise is, any examples of actors taking advantage of military's reduced readiness from the, p the pandemic? I think it's Dr. Clisson might, might answer this. Another question is, how will the form of alliance-based cooperation among regional allies change or evolve after the pandemic? I think this alliance structure and the other multilateral uh, grouping is a little different, so that's what I think is his intended, the question, the question behind. And let's see, has the pandemic led you, panels, to revise the idea that economic and military power matter more than any other factor in international politics? That's very interesting questions. And there seems to be a correlation between the climate change and emergence of new infectious disease. How is the defense sector working together with others on this? Uh, Okay, so in case of traditional uh, security threat is the, you know, powerful nation, great powers matter and more important. What do you think about this uh, non-traditional uh, security threat? Is the same logic or, you know, less power countries should involve more? Or is it, it's possible? So let me, Go back to the original order. 
So including your last comment, you can pick the, the questions you want to answer. Start with uh, Dr. Nohun. <coughs> Well, it would be very difficult to answer the questions one by one, but let me take this opportunity to take an overall look at today's session. We talked about how we're going to deal with non-traditional security threats, and one of the approach was through international cooperation. We talked about how meaningful international cooperation would be. Having said that, in executing international cooperation, we also discussed how traditional security threats would impact the international cooperation that is necessary for non-traditional security threats. For example, the conflict between the G2. As such conflicts are underlining the current situation, the international solidarity for cooperating in responding to non-traditional security threats is being impacted. And this is something that all of us can relate to. Having said that, we still have the need to overcome these issues. The role of the military Concerning this point, to the best of my understanding, I think people would like to see the military doing what it can. And there are also areas that are necessary for the military to act, especially in terms of efficiency. And I think there is an understanding for this. But I would also like to add that we did not talk about the military specifically, but rather non-traditional security threats overall. And so I think we did not cover the relationship between the military and civil organizations. This is an area that Korea has a lot of interest for. Most non-traditional security threats have organizations that are dedicated to such threats. For example, we have the police or the fire department or economic organizations that deal with poverty. But despite these organizations, how effectively are they playing their role and what should be the support provided by the military? I think it's very difficult to decide the roles and responsibilities of different organizations. And so in Korea, many people are interested in the legal foundation for the roles and responsibilities. And we are also trying to benchmark international examples. We also need to find ways to collaborate between different organizations through communicating when participating in the response for similar or the same non-traditional security threats. So this issue of communication, for example, communication between the police and the military, or communication between the military or a department in charge of a specific disaster, I think should be discussed in advance so that we can communicate throughout the process of disasters. For example, we need to use the same terminology. In the US, we have the Department of Homeland Security. And ever since 911, when this department was established, it actually absorbed the Organization for Disaster Management. And in that process, I understand that communication was very difficult. And so they needed to continue to talk about terminology and better ways of communication. And so international cooperation is surely important, but communication and 
cooperation amongst domestic bodies would also be important. And so I would also like to see the sharing of relevant experiences. Thank you. When it comes to the information technology, the U.S. is more advanced and uh, IT technologies developed by the Department of Defense in the U.S. is often adopted by the civilian sector. But in Korea, there is a close connection between the civilian sector and the military for IT development. And usually, it's the Korean military that adopts uh, technology developed in the civilian sector. But now, with the spread of the COVID-19 virus, we have to figure out how to utilize non-contact services in the military in a secure manner, we need to work on this. As I mentioned in my initial remarks, for instance, when it comes to the operation of data centers for the military, if these data centers are infected, if they have to be shut down, then the military will be paralyzed. And there is no way to address this. So we need to have, we need to put in place procedures and processes to ensure data um, security. For instance, we need to have some dual system or backup system, or we need to have dual access routes. So if one access route is, uh, is closed, then the other access route will still be utilized. So we need such actual procedures in place so that the military can continue to operate in a cyber space. So these are the kinds of issues that we need to address. For instance, we can have dual data centers, or we can have dual uh, control system. But if such dual data centers or command systems are under attack, what can we do? We need contingency planning. These are the kinds of issues that have not been fully addressed even in advanced IT countries. So we need to do research and development on these important issues. Uh, it will be something that can be done partially in Korea, but this is something that requires international cooperation. Um, and for instance, if one military unit is having some IT problem, then the other military units, what they can do to cover for that. So there are many issues that we need to clarify. And at the same time, we need to have rules and policies regarding that. Thank you. Dr. White, you're the next. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, I'll, ju I'll just touch on a couple of the questions that you've that, that you've raised. The first is, uh, has the pandemic um, overturned the idea that economic and military power matters most? Well, uh, what it tells you, what we've learned, I think, is that or relearned, is that economic and and military power isn't everything, but it still determines the basic order of uh, of power in the. Uh, in the international system, and it does, still does also, as the as power shifts and as wealth shifts, it still does drive strategic rivalry. And I think, as we have remarked earlier in this very interesting conversation, the way in which the U.S. and China, for example, have become increasingly bitter strategic rivals in recent years has had a big impact on the way the pandemic has been handled. And that leads me to one of the other questions uh, which you, which you raised, and that is: Do great powers or do middle powers matter more in managing these kinds of non-traditional security threats? Well, I think great powers, and the way they relate to one another, do a great deal to set the framework within which these non-traditional security threats must be managed. But the way things have panned out, I think the middle powers do play a very important, even an outsized role. And I think the discussion, the issue that was touched on a bit earlier in our conversation about the role that countries like Korea. South Korea can play as a kind of thought leader internationally, as an exemplar for how these systems should be managed. And we've, we've, we've referred to how well South Korea has managed the pandemic. I think that is really important. And I think it's one of the reasons why conversations like this are so valuable. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Director Bodifas. <laughs> Coming back to your division between authoritarian regime and democratic regime, uh, which is uh, the best to, to deal with the disease. I don't think that uh, due to the fact that the uh, US has failed to deal with the COVID-19 and China has succeeded 
uh, we don't have to draw the conclusion that office and regime are in a better position to deal with this kind of challenge because South Korea, Taiwan, New Zealand has deal very well with pandemic. So I think the line of division is between the country uh, which have a long term view and the country which have a short term view. And uh, of course, when you look at that, you see, uh, you, you clearly have a conclusion that uh, um, if you have a short term view, you could find that unilateralism is a solution, but on the long term, only multilateralism is a solution. And we have the right to be selfish, but we don't have the right not to be clever. And if you are clever, you choose multilateralism. Thank you very much. And Thank you, and thank you for the for the conversation. It was a wonderful evening. Uh, the question was asked is, uh, do I have an example of someone taking advantage of reduced readiness? Uh, I would turn that around. I, I think that um, in crises, we have an opportunity to do rapid learning and rapid research. I mentioned the uh, USS Roosevelt, which uh, had the, that was an aircraft carrier that had the, uh, the sickness on board. And I mentioned that a month later, another ship had a discovery of a patient with COVID on board. It was a much smaller ship. It was off the coast of South America. And the Navy had figured out in a month how to get a team with the right equipment out to the ship uh, 200 miles off the coast and be able to treat, treat patients within 24 hours, something they didn't know how to do before by looking at what happened and learning lessons. In disaster preparedness, uh, we talk about natural disasters, physical disasters like tsunamis and typhoons or hurricanes or tropical cyclones, the damage from those. One of the traditional discussions in disaster management is what to do in a pandemic. And the, the model that's usually used is pandemic influenza, but COVID is ex extremely close to the same thing. Uh, it, gives us an opportunity to actually see what does happen, see what the cooperation is and is not, and develop the capabilities uh, learning from the actual lesson rather than doing it in a classroom. And somebody mentioned the creation of the uh, Department of Homeland Security and uh, FEMA, a uh, federal emergency management activity or uh, agency in the United States coming out of 9-11 of, uh, and Katrina. It took all these disparate agencies, put them together, and did solve a lot of the communication problems and came up with a national disaster response capability that we didn't have before, a very quick lesson learned. So I think the world has an opportunity to now to do some very rapid learning if we take advantage of it to hopefully come up with the structures that I was concerned do not exist that we can use in the future. So I'll be the optimist on that one. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Collison. I think we are about to end. Uh, I, actually, I'm not a specialist specialist in this in this area. I'm an international relations expert, uh, students for 30 years. So I'm, uh, you know, deeply related, and I'm so much interested in. And I learned so much tonight, and I, we had a, a great uh, discussions. I think somebody could ask about this this uh, issues, especially. The issue of non-traditional security threat. What in the world South Korea is talking about this? And somebody can wonder. You know, we are in the middle of traditional threat and divided nations. I think that's the point. I think we are, many, many panelists talked about this hybrid situation and balance between the traditional and non-traditional. I can, it can be a milestone, and Dr. Carlson talked about the opportunity to test, you know, or to move forward from divisions and the threats that we can make this opportunity to cooperate and this big test case for world community to tackle it together. And President Moon, his one of the conviction is we are, you know, this peace through deterrence has fundamental limitations. It did a good job, but it's not, you know, guaranteed permanent peace. We need this, you know, non-traditional or human security he talked about. And when, you know, 
as I commented before, in 1994, UN raised the issue, but it didn't really spread out and was not successful. Maybe we can uh, rephrase and, and rekindle these issues. And we are not big enough to tackle with the seven issues you know, all around, but Korea is trying to concentrate on this, the disease control and the climate change. So I think we need, you know, as I said, in this area of a geopolitical rivalry, maybe, you know, this, you know, uh, liberal international order, we should work together to sustain it. I think it's openness, democracy, accountability should be sustained. Again, thank you very much for your insightful and thank you all the audience is taking your precious time to take part in discussions. Even though it's inconvenient time differences there. And stay well, everybody. Thank you very much. Good night and good morning or goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>